Lion Boy, Chapter 12 After Ron, they had to slow down even more. The river was narrower and the water shallower, with islands and sandbanks to negotiate. From time to time, the Circe had to cross from one side of the river to the other to find the deep channel. Crossing was quite a palaver because all the other boats around had to know what the big ship was going to do. So the sailor guys would hang a large blue board out to starboard with a flashing white light at its centre to warn them. When boats were planning to overtake, they had to communicate with each other too. Charlie hung over the deck railings next to the figurehead, trying to work out if there was a pattern in all of the hooting and tooting. But just when he thought he was getting it, McComo would call him in to do some job, or a sailor would tell him to go and get out of the way. Charlie had never been to France before, and between fretting, planning, stealing conversations with the lions and all the extra jobs involved as Paris and the shore grew closer, he had time to admire it. A pale path followed much of the bank of the river for horses and tow barges, with every now and then an emergency recharging point for electro barges who hadn't charged up properly overnight and electric berths. The tow path was lined by tall straight trees set as regular as soldiers and beyond them lay wide flat green fields and occasionally a golden grey farmhouse with black and white cows and apple trees set about them. In the far distance he could see the silvery towers of faraway towns and the gleaming line of a main road. The river itself was quite isolated and quiet and beautiful. From time to time he could sit and enjoy a calm moment in the ship after a buffety sea passage and the speed of race to Rhone and feel the warmth of the sun on his cheek. All the while he watched out for any cat who might be able to give him any information. The day they left Rhone the lock started. Humphreyville was the first and it took two hours to manoeuvre the Circe into the great chamber on the river. Close to the gates behind her, wait for the box to fill up with water beneath her, bringing her up to the level of the section of the river they were moving to. Charlie had seen locks on canals before, small ones taking in the whole canal, regular as matchbox and operated by hand. This was something else. For a start, it only occupied a small amount of the river, which was busy erupting in rapids and little waterfalls and rocks all around. It was as if a section of canal had been built in the middle of the river and when the Circe came out the other end of it the water was higher up beyond the rapids and waterfalls and locks and sailing along smoothly again leaving all perils behind. You'd never get a big boat up here without all this he observed. Ah said Julius but the Seine was never as bad as the oak. The what? asked Charlie dutifully. He liked Julius explaining things. He was amazed that such a young boy knew so many things. Sometimes Julius gave him a look which seemed to say, I hope I'm not boring you. Julius knew that not everybody was interested. It made him shy sometimes, but not Charlie. On the Aussie, began Julius. Sorry, what's the Aussie? interrupted Charlie. Julius gave him a pitying look. It's one of the other rivers that goes to Paris, he said. And in the old days, the old, old days, by which Charlie knew he meant not just before the petrol ran out, but before the petrol was discovered in the first place, they brought wood and stone down it from the countryside to Paris for building. It was really quick and wild river, and the boats just came hurtling down on the current, which is very, very fast. And then when they got to the weir, they would just shoot over the top and plunge down into the waters below. So loads of people drown and half the boats were broken and wrecked. And even if they weren't, when they got to Paris, they were destroyed anyway, because there was no way back up. Charlie gave a little shiver. Half of him quite fancied it. The other half thought it sounded extremely scary. Each time they passed along low, narrow French electro barge, tooting as it went. One long and one short definitely meant I'm going to overtake, but one long and two short seemed to mean it too. He couldn't get the hang of it. Charlie sought and scoured the decks for a cat. No luck. Why are there so few? 
He saw one asleep under the trees and one in the basket of a bicycle being ridden along the pale path unwinding like a ribbon under the trees, but none he could talk to. Then, approaching the lock at Notre Dame de la Garenne, they came upon a barge going their own way, towed by horse in the old-fashioned way. In the flurry of communications and negotiations involving locking in and out, he spotted the barge's cat, a fat, cheerful-looking tabby, coiled like a rope on the barge roof. Excuse me, Monsieur Cat, he called. Mademoiselle Chat, if you please, replied the tabby, sticking her leg out and reaching it a bit and stretching it a bit lazily. Sorry, Mademoiselle, cried Charlie. Look, could you come aboard and talk to me a moment? The cat, opening her sleepy eyes, realised she was being addressed by a human and was so surprised that she rolled right off the roof and started to hiss. Yes, I know, I'm very unusual, sorry, said Charlie, but please, just for a moment, then we can drop you and you can regain your own boat later when it comes up. Please, come on now, please. The tabby gave him a very bashful stare, but her curiosity overcame her. Cats are very curious, as you may know. And she was not too proud to leap from the roof to one of the circus ship's fenders, which she caught with her claws before easing herself elegantly over the side, with a grace which suggested that she had been, it had been no effort whatsoever, and whoever thought it had been was simply rude. And your point is, she said. Charlie, with great courtesy and some charming compliments, because he had read somewhere that French people are gallant, explained that he desperately needed to hear if there was any talk or gossip on the waterways about a pair of English humans, one black, one white, one male, one female, who had been stolen away and taken to Paris in a submarine, and the English cats were interested. You look like a lady who would know everything there was worth knowing, mademoiselle, he said charmingly. I look like a monsieur, she replied. You said so yourself. I was momentarily blinded, he replied, which was a phrase he had heard his father use once when he mistook a papal envoy in his fine scarlet robes for a beautiful lady in a red dress. Confused by your glamour, he said seriously. Hoped that it was all right to say that sort of thing to a French canal cat. It had, be, it had gone down fine with the papal envoy, but you never can tell how people you don't know are going to take things. The cat laughed. A cat's laugh is quite something, especially a French one. It doesn't matter, she said. I do know everything. Are you the boy? Charlie looked round. I'm a boy, he agreed cautiously. But are you the boy? The tabby asked again. In what sense? asked Charlie. He really didn't know if he was the boy from the cat's point of view and he didn't want to claim to be some boy that he wasn't. The boy who lost his parents and is following in search of them. Ah, that boy. Yes, said Charlie. I think I must be. I mean, I have lost my parents and I am following in search of them. The cat looked at him with sympathy. They are way ahead. They'll be there tomorrow morning. Easily, I heard. Tomorrow morning? Charlie wanted to swear, remembering how his father had told him one reason you shouldn't swear is because when you really need a strong word to express your feelings, you would have none strong enough left. But tomorrow morning, if they were that far ahead, how could he ever find them in Paris? He was days behind them. How would the cats there know to keep track of them? And how would he get any more news? Charlie was a brave boy and quite a tough one, tougher than he thought he was, but when he heard this bad news he sat down on a coil of rope and tears sprang into his eyes. In this moment of disappointment, thoughts that he had managed to keep away from himself so far began to sneak into his mind. Thoughts like, how are they feeling? And are they worrying about me? And how could anyone have ever overpowered my great strong dad in the first place? And when will I see them again? And even, will I see them again? The deck was quiet because most people had gone in to eat, but even so, he was not, not, not going to cry anywhere anyone might see him. He jumped up to rush into the rope store, but as he did so, Mademoiselle Chat, in a sudden burst of pity, said, Don't worry, everybody is looking for them, everybody will help you, 
Everyone knows the story. Charlie looked up, blinking. What story? he asked. Mademoiselle Shep twitched her whiskers and said, The story of your parents, who they are. What is their story? said Charlie. He had a sudden, very strong feeling that this story might fill in the gaps for him. Why they had been taken, who by, and maybe even where to. Tell me, he said urgently. Tell me. If you don't know, said Mademoiselle Shab, then maybe you are not the boy. She looked doubtful rather than suspicious, but even so, Charlie was now filled with a burning need to hear the story immediately. How could he find and rescue them if he didn't know everything there was to know? Tell me, he said furiously. I have to know them. My parents, what's the story? I can't say, she said quietly, just because in case... But if you are you, don't be afraid. Before Charlie could stop her, she leapt swiftly from the deck of the circus ship into the water. Come back, Charlie shouted, not caring now who saw him yelling in cat from the deck. Come back, cats don't swim, come back. But she didn't. Charlie stared furiously after her, then furiously kicked a pile of coiled ropes, knocking them over and earning himself an earful from the sailor who had just coiled them up. Charlie didn't even hear him. He was livid. If you are you, don't be afraid. Well, of course he was him, and of course he was afraid. He'd just been told his parents would be in Paris long before him, and he'd probably lose them. And there was some great mystery going on about his mum and dad, which he apparently was the only person not to know. And now some blooming cat was suggesting that he wasn't even himself. Rats, he shouted which gave the cross sailor a shock and sent him scurrying off saying, where, where, I'll get my gun, I must tell the cook. Charlie leaned over the side, scratching his head, staring out over France. Gradually, his anger slipped away, leaving only one question in mind, whether or not Raffi knew where he was. Should he try to leave the circus boat and get to Paris quicker by some other means? It didn't take long to realise that this idea was a no-goer. For a start, what other means? Unless he was intending to ride a tall silvery tree into Paris, he'd be walking, because the floating circus was the fastest craft on the water, and there was nobody using the path at all, let alone anybody in a nice quick petrol car. And then he had promised the lions, and he didn't break his promises. And even if he was the kind of person who did, he didn't think breaking promises to lions could ever be a good idea. No. He just had to bite his lip and carry on gliding up this wide and windy river. Charlie knew that worrying about something you can't change is pointless, but he couldn't stop himself. He was miserable about his parents. He didn't think he could bear this delay. All the next few days, he fetched and carried, swept and yanked, tipped out drugged water and filled up with clean. He pondered the two questions, lion escape and parental mystery. Lion escape was easier to think about because he had some answers and he did, and it didn't make him want to cry. So he chatted innocently to everyone about the show and who would be where and what happened when and he wandered the ship looking for ways on and off for gangplanks and hatches that would give easy access to the shore. The public gangplank was on the starboard side of the ship. It was broad and open and led to the grand staircase down to the foyer and the big top. Could they make it along the public gangplank? Perhaps if they ran during the show, say after the lions did their act, but before the show was over, because nobody would be there. Perhaps they should go in the dead of night, but with Macomo sleeping in the lion cabin, he didn't fancy their chances. No, it seemed to Charlie that the time to run away was after the show, when there would be a lot of people toing and froing and everyone would be excited about how well it had gone and nobody except Macomo would notice that the lions weren't there. Perhaps he could persuade Macomo to let him put the lions to bed after the show. Perhaps if someone were to invite Macomo out after the show, then Charlie would be left in charge and they would have some hours before they'd be missed. But who would Macomo want to go out with in Paris? Charlie thought and thought and thought, and gradually his ideas started to fall into shape, but he needed help. Then, at Andresy, when Macomo went out to the Moroccan restaurant, 
a mangy, travel-stained, bald-bottomed bald cat came aboard the Circe, carrying a chewed and grubby bit of paper in his yellow teeth.